there. My name is Dr. Salim Javed and we are talking about triatic pyramid. We have been discussing about, uh, you know, the five distinct acts called exposition, rising action, climax, falling action or conclusion and denouncement. If you remember, we just talked about uh, uh, exposition and exciting force. Now, let us understand second part of it called rising action or rising moment. Now, in the second act of triatic pyramid, you know, which is denoted as the rising moment, rising movement, the narrative progresses by introducing hurdles that impede the character's progress towards their objective, thus building towards the primary confrontation. The narrative intensifies as other characters are introduced, including the, the chief antagonist and other opponents who contribute to the situation's complexity for the remaining characters. Now, this is very uh, academic uh, writing, but what does it mean? Like suppose, let us understand it from uh, Aristotle point of view, like uh, rising action is technically we have entered in act 2, you know. So, what is so unique about Freytag, even the, you know, um, Aristotle also says that when you are entering in act 2, your stakes are high. You know, there is no going back as I explained. There is no going back once you have, you know, signed for all the complexities in the plot, you know. So, there is no going back. So, this is how this, um, you know, act 2 starts, you know. So, so rising movement or rising action, you know, or, or rising, you know, or entering in act 2, you know, where you are introducing not exactly at the beginning of act 2. At many places, yes, you introduce the antagonist, there is no problem. You know, by the time, you know, act one ends, there are places where you are introducing antagonist also. Or if not physically, then at least in terms of information and everything you are establishing. Or uh, at many places, in act one, you know what is going to be the main problem in the plot, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, events, not in terms of writing. So, you introduce your antagonist also and if not at least uh, the main antagonist, you introduce the sidekicks, you know, for sure in act 2 you introduce the sidekicks. Like in Bahubali, you introduce the army of uh, Bhalal Dev, you know, not Bhalal Dev himself. There has to be a grand entry of the antagonist, you know, like um, uh, this film. Uh, which was that film where you have the entry, a uh, very interesting entry um, of uh, Rolex, entry of Rolex, the character's name is Rolex. Um, what is that film? Very interesting film. I think Jailer, no, no, not Jailer. There is some, some other film. Uh, so, uh, so act, the moment you, uh, I mean, please forgive me when I call it act 2 because there is a very, uh, very, you know, clear similarity, you know, uh, between Aristotle and Friartag. And so, uh, this rising action is where, you know, hurdles that uh, impede the character's progress towards their objective, thus building towards the primary confrontation, the narrative intensifies, you know. This is very important that the narrative intensifies as other characters are introduced, including the chief antagonist and other opponents. So, maybe there are like many stories like uh, Moriarty for that matter, when you talk about uh, Sherlock Holmes. Moriarty, uh, like when I started reading um, um, uh, this character, you know, and this novel. Uh, so, I was like, Mor I got to know it quite late that it is, um, it is a construct of Moriarty uh, for uh, the detective that he is basically testing him through different people, through different uh, antagonists and, you know, later on Moriarty and the detective meets, you know, in, in, in film, which is uh, Robert Downey Jr., you know, you meet in the second part of the film. But if you see basically the, the television series and especially this BBC um, uh, series, uh, where uh, um, the, where the recent BBC series, then you realize that Moriarty is something, you know, um, which comes quite late in the story. But obviously, there is always not very obvious, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, you're, you, when you're spilling the beans, you know, there is not very obvious reference to Moriarty, but there is like some way or the other, you know, and when Moriarty, Moriarty is introduced, you know that uh, Sherlock Holmes has always been challenged through different uh, opponents uh, which were implanted by Moriarty. So, you know, uh, th th that's how television writing and uh, film writing is very, very different. That uh, if uh, you ha if you're writing for web series, you know, th that is this is one very stark difference. When you're writing for web series, you know, you can have the main antagonist maybe in season 2, maybe in season 3, maybe in season 4, that depends how strong your writing is. But when you are writing a feature film, unless you have not decided, like, um, you know, uh, this is very true in, sense of, in, in the sense of James Bond, you know, uh, especially the recent Daniel Craig, James Bond, you know, there was one specific organization, one specific player, and he comes, I think, in fourth part in in a series of five parts, or 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 in fifth part. You know that is, you know, uh, if you have when you are writing and you actually know that how many parts you are going to play up. Like there is a very common, um, you know, common demand when you start writing for web series nowadays. Uh, first of all, they need to like your idea. This has to be intact. This has to be perfectly all right. But only one season, you know, as, uh, like uh, as a writer, especially as a writer, and on the other hand, as a producer also, you really need to be very sure that you can create a spin-off, you know, be that the prequel or be that the sequel. And that's the that's that's very important. That when you are creating a season, you know, be that of 8 episode or 10 episode and then you know that your story has moved from point A to point F for that matter, A, B, C, D, E, F, C, B, C, D, E, F, you know, or H, I, you know, uh, whatever it has moved. There has, there is something called seasons graph, you know. Writers are asked for it, seasons graph, what is, what is the graph of the season? This helps, it rather it, it, it acts as a savior when you have, you know, season graph in your mind. Season graph is what? That you know that your story will start here, your story will end here, you know that something is like far existing somewhere else also which will be presented maybe in other season and if there is no good response of of the web series or there is no good response of the film you know you can stop it here but there all there is always something called season graph even like this is a word now that i always discuss with my students also that think in terms of a season you know, that's a very recent, not recent, it has been existing for the last 20 years now, you know. So, it is, it is very, because earlier when it, when you think of, uh, you know, uh, um, cinema before 2000, so there was nothing more than cinema, you know, either you had television or you had a feature film, you know, made in Bombay or Hollywood or in South, anywhere which are the film producing countries. But now you are making films in Mahallas, you know, now there are content creators in every house, you know. So, now web, web, web series is something which is appreciated. Now you don't need Amazon or Netflix for that matter, you know. Uh, YouTube itself has become so big that there are a lot of production houses. TYF, I, I think, um, Sapne versus Reality, you know, recently released a very popular um, web, very popular web series, uh, received very well by people, liked like crazy by people. So, so you don't need to show your film on Netflix or Amazon or Hulu for that matter. You know, you you YouTube is more than enough now. You know, um, and it has big. It, it it has made itself a, a brand. So that is very important. So, what sort of a conflict do you have in your story? You know, 
that is what makes your product or breaks your product now if i have seen like suppose if i have seen james bond or if i have seen uh, um for that matter if i know about moriarty or if i know about uh, um maybe if about the, um uh, this uh, byomkesh bakshi you know so there you have uh, uh, sherlock holmes here we have byomkesh bakshi so you, you, you know so that reference is there in the mind so protagonist yeah, antagonist you know um you know uh, rising movements or for that matter co- confrontation chief antagonist you know they really need to be um beyond your expectation now so it is like um, suppose if your story has like we we are very used to of seeing a antagonist who is very scary who is well built who is like uh, who looks like a giant but uh, imagine somebody who is 16 years old frail but he is the main antagonist you know there are a lot of films which have got la- like uh, entire film is all about who is the main antagonist who is the main antagonist who is the main antagonist and you just find out this kid is an antagonist how this is possible but it is all writing you know and the power to reach up till that point that you you have people convinced no no this is really right antagonist so it is not only about protagonist it's also about antagonist you know now the rising action uh, phase occupies the center left position inside the narrative pyramid immediately above the exposition segment the rising action you know um and compens of the narrative delves into the story's conflict leading up to the cinematic point frequently there is a progression towards a more unfavorable state in this particular segment of the narrative characterized by insta- uh, instances such as characters erroneous choice the infliction of harm upon the protagonist by the antagonist upon the antagonist uh, you know uh, and the introduction of other characters that contribute to the intricacy of storyline and similar occurrences now let me just um, uh, you know summarize it for you you know act to alone you know so it is not only about i always say this um, to the students that i teach that it's not you cannot say the entire story through protagonist and antagonist there so that's your plot there is no denial of this fact absolutely but there has to be sub stories there has to be other people in the world there has to be you know um there has to be a progression uh, there has to be you know um, there has to be a lakshman there has to be a bharat there has to be a shatrughan you know and uh, story will also move through them so there has to be a sugriv there has to be a bali you know so you, you you know why am i giving you all these examples reason being that it's not only about the main plot it's also about subplots also and it is the these subplots which which makes your you know ultimately all subplots will merge into main plot you know sub stories you know if you remember we talked about how sub plots are there uh, i gave you an example of film called matrix and i gave you five to six sub plots within that story you know on one hand you have neo on one hand you have neo and trinity then you have neos and uh, morpheus relation then you have uh, you know Cy- um, what is his name cyrus uh, the main uh, not the main villain main villain is the system itself uh, cyrus or cipher you know the other guy who's in part 1 so you know even the subplot will contribute towards the main plot there is no there is no doubt about it but you need to have subplot otherwise this progression you know we, that's sometimes like take example of three idiots you know it is not only about rancho you know it's not only about rancho it's about silencer also it's about uh, raju also it's about uh, 
uh, Farhan also, it is about uh, the love story also, it is about uh, elder sister also, it is about the principal also, it is about uh, uh, that librarian also, it is about uh, um, you know uh, the guy who is not Rancho also, it is about his father also, it is about uh, millimeter also, it is about everyone. But that everyone is merged into highlighting the importance of uh, Rancho, Raju and Farhan and obviously silence, you know. So, unless there is a pro progression only in one branch will not make it a tree, please understand. This is a very like a very logical example, progression only in one branch of the tree will not make it a tree, it will be disproportionate. So, you need to have progression in all the branches, the, when you have progression in all the branches of a tree, then only you see a tree in, to, in a true conventional sense, you know, then you see a tree in true conventional sense. When you draw a tree, you are basically progressing all the branches you are not focusing only on one branch, you know. So, if you only worry about or if you only write about your man, main character, it is all that, that you are, you are focusing, you, th there is a progression only in one branch of the tree, which is not possible, which is technically not possible. There can never be only a progression in one branch of the tree. So, if you are saying it a tree in a conventional sense, you find out that it is a tree. So, that tree will have progression everywhere. You know, if it is a big tree, it means there are deep roots. If it is a big tree, it means its trunk is in proportion with its shape. If it is a big tree, there has to be a certain number of branches. If it is a big tree, there has to be a certain number of leaves, you know. So, it ha there has to be, I mean I, th I think it is a very good example that the progression cannot be in, in terms of only one branch, it has to have, the progression has to have all the branches, um, you, you know, ready. And this particular progression in terms of writing, it is not only about main plot, it is about subplots also. The day you have your plots and subplot in balance, in story which is a very difficult job, you know, sometimes when you start writing, there is no track, even as a writer you are not able to keep track that uh, a certain branch is like more important than other branches or one subplot is more important than other, other plots, but that is what good writers do. The progression is everywhere, not only in one branch. Always remember this when you are writing, this is really very original <laughs> explanation which has just come up, but it is it's really, really nice. So, now, so the rising action phase is, um, uh, the, so the rising action phase in many stories occupies a significant portion of uh, textual c content. Nevertheless, it is imperative to note that this particular section of the literary work I use this word called literary work because I find screenplay writing uh, as, a liter uh, as a piece of art delves into their uh, intricacies and challenges of the narrative conflict. However, it is crucial to acknowledge that the rising action should en encompass a broader scope expanding beyond the mere progression of the plot. Now, when it is like suppose if duration wise um, in terms of act uh, three act structure. So, this particular portion is is act technically very long than the first part, you know and uh, like this helps you, um, you know, uh, absorb the audience in, in, in true sense. So, no? so, during the rising action phase, the reader is frequently provided significant elements of the character's background information that I was talking about, that from where this small child in Bahubali has come. Throughout the progression of the conflict, it is expected that the reader or the audience will acquire a deep understanding of the character's 
motivations, the narrative settings, the thematic elements being examined and the potential inclusion of foreshadowing leading up to the climax. Now this is, you know, because technically duration wise in terms of writing, if not one hour, you know, because it's if now a five act structure, if not one hour, uh, it is not occupying less than 45 minutes. Now 45 minutes on screen is such a huge time. It's such a huge time that uh, either you are trying all the knowledge, the craft that you have acquired to hold the audience, a moment you will lose them. In a moment you will lose them. So holding people for such, such a long duration, for such a long duration is the responsibility of this part. Now it is not that if there is a challenge of 45 minutes technically because now it is a 5 act structure. Had it been 3 act structure, the duration would have been at least 1 hour. So let us consider it as a 45 minutes to maximum 50 minutes duration. Now this 50 minutes or 45 minutes or 50 minutes duration, if it it is such a long time on screen, very, very long time on screen. So there are sections, you know. So if I ask, if somebody understands cinema and I, I, I ask him as a student, okay, you have got 45 minutes or 50 minutes, you have to fill in something in this 45 or 50 minutes and the condition is that you have to keep my interest intact. Now this can be very dangerous demand technically from a student or even from professionals. 45 minutes, it is a, it's a time of a life actually. I always say 2 hours is like it can sometimes take a life of someone. So it is maybe it is 2 hours for you but somebody has given life to these 2 hours. You know somebody's best work, somebody's first work, somebody's maybe somebody's last work. You know, so those, those two words which we, you know, sometimes just simply brush off, ah, madani hai, you know, it makes and breaks somebody's career, it kills someone's lives, it gives birth to someone, it convinces someone, it breaks the heart of some people. So simply brushing off is like very, very dangerous um, act in terms of when you are part of the system, when you know how it works. So brushing off is a dangerous thing in terms of creative work and or in terms of like in students also like saying, okay, you will not be able to You know, it's, it's not use, it's not, it's entirely useless. So brushing off, I always scared of brushing off, you know. So, so 45 minutes is the time of a life actually. It's not a lifetime, it's a time of a life, you know. So during the rising action phase, the reader is frequently provided significant elements of the character's background information. Now this is important. Uh, why you like certain films and why do you not like certain films? There can be a thematic analysis of every film, you know. And why some there are some films which are not liked immediately by the people, but there are those films becomes cult classic after a certain number of years. Like I distinctly remember uh, Piazza for that matter. I can watch Piazza n number of times. I can watch Piazza n number of times. I don't know b why, but you know, if ever I could do a thematic analysis of Piazza, I'm very sure that uh, the artistry that has gone into making that film, which was not accepted when it was released, it was accepted, it became a gem after certain. Um, uh, e after certain years when it was released, you will understand that it is all how people, you, you know, that's why I always say that I am scared of brushing off things. That's actually a very dangerous exercise in terms of creative world, labeling that he is a hit, he is a flop, you know, that's, that's too, too dangerous. So remember that during the rising action phase, the reader is frequently provided significant elements of the character's background information throughout the progression of the conflict, it is expected that the reader or the audience will acquire a deep understanding 
of the character's motivation, the narrative settings, the thematic elements being examined and the potential inclusion of foreshadowing leading up to the climax. We will talk about climax very soon. Thank you very much.